I pay Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. We pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and extend our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Islander people present with us to present with us today. So, welcome everyone. I want to announce some future events first for the rest remainder of the year. There is a toast to end of the year uh, on 29th of November, 2022. On the 8th of December, unlock your full potential as a BA. And then um, in this next year, year, we even have an event coming for next year. So, so register. We have our last um, Sydney branch. The other thing we would do is call for volunteers. Um, look out for um, expression of interest in your newsletter and then click the link. I would like now to introduce um, our speaker, uh, James Barnes. Um, James is the director of Smart BA. Um, he will be discussing BA capability in the environment and society governance framework world. Uh, a smart BA is a business analyst consultancy firm that provides project delivery services to government and commercial sector. I just want to say good evening. I, James from Smart BA, I am going to be talking about ESG um, and the upcoming framework in that sustainability space. Um, from a BA's perspective, I want to be able to talk about the central stakeholder, which is the business itself. We are all business analysts. Um, then the, the central, as I said, the central stakeholder, the business and its ESG relevance, um, the business reporting mechanisms now and the ESG future. Um, give some context around why we're going into ESG and some of those drivers behind that change in the sustainability space. And drill down a bit more on what is ESG and what can a business do. And then talk about stakeholder engagement and alignment, stakeholder, stakeholders in the ESG groupings and key messages and questions that we may ask them on that transition journey, what I'm calling the ESG journey steps. So by the time we have finished tonight, we may run over a little bit of that. Uh, Okay, so by the end of this session, uh, we should be able to walk away with understanding the strategic alignment of the ESG space, the implementation of the ESG framework, and some of the tools around it and where you can fit in as a BA. So going down, I just want to start off with my favourite quote, new quote, current quote. The purpose of business is to produce profitable solutions. That was always the way. Uh, your quote is to solve the problems of people and planet and in the process produce profits. I have shared this before in previous IBA presentation, but I think it's terribly apt. So I'd just like to share it with everyone. We're all business analysts, and I want people to sort of get in the frame, frame of mind of the business analysts, business around producing profit. So the next thing I'd want to do is just talk about our central stakeholder, the business, the business analysts. We focus on business or organisations. So I want people in the next slide, take people take a larger view of the stakeholder, the business itself. It always has financial impacts. Everything that happens within the business has a financial impact. I try and keep this in mind as you perform your BA activities. It's not just that SDLC for that little piece of software. It has bigger impacts and in initiative, project, programme work. So each project we do is, it should be the consequence of a decision made to further business and meet strategic objectives. Decisions, decisions come from the board and the executive help to enable those things. That's what we call no. governance in the ESG framework. That's the G part of ESG. Society, Society. that's the S part. That's communities, uh, both internal and external. Um, so external will be your supply chain and customers, and internal is, is your employees. But my words are a bit mixed up there. Key, Key point, point no business stands alone. It needs its community, it needs its suppliers, it needs its customers, and it needs its communities outside to help support it. And the environment, that's another one. It's one that's been missed through generations and generations of business. It's never accounted for. But that is part of what's going on in the ESG framework is the environment itself. It supplies the natural resources. We convert oil and make plastics and energy supplies. We're using up energy all the time. So I want people to think about the stakeholders, the business. It's not just profit. It's not just the business itself. It's these other components. Governance drives it all. 
but it's the community, society, and the environment. So who will represent the environment in the stakeholder? So, so um, let me talk about that. Just everyone. So here's our typical model. This is the current model, current state, the organization, the operations, inputs, the conversion process, and the outputs to customers. The typical profit and loss makes profit, which goes into a balance sheet. You can tell I was an accountant at one stage. So the business decides, hey, let's make a strategic decision. Let's go down the ESG circular framework models. So under a strategic change, you're going to take some analysis, build a roadmap, which is going to produce outcomes, hopefully, and some measurements. So we choose ESG, <clears throat> environmental society and governance, the transformation to sustainability. So in, but in the environment and society space, we're reporting on those stakeholders, engagement and the utility of uh, the environment. From the governance point of view, it's how those decisions are made around the usage of those stakeholders, the metrics and the enablement of getting things done. I just wanna call out something else we start to measure the environment and society in the ESG framework, not just profit. And finally, I just wanted to throw this in here. We're not talking about this tonight, but I would love to talk about it at a future date, is the circular economics, which is all about renewables, recycling, repurposing, and sharing services. Take, for instance, the ride share of go-get car, those sorts of things. That's about minimizing climate change and mitigating things by utilizing services. We'll talk about it another time, but it's a subset of the two major key frameworks in the sustainability space that um, are going towards mitigating climate, frame, uh, climate change uh, uh, impacts. So going forward, I want to talk about the context and drivers of change. Well, we've all seen the news. We all know what's going on. Climate change is here. It's no doubt there. Um, as you notice in the news, COP27 just wrapped up in the last week, which is that annual global meeting of big business leaders, climate change action people. Um, and I believe one of the biggest agreements was that uh, the larger well developed economies are going to be subsidizing the less fortunate um, places in Africa and places like that for the damage that we have done to them with climate change because they can't afford it. Lit litigation is on the rise worldwide uh, in this space. Um, it's being legislated, duties, disclosure, and what they're doing about it. These are the key things that businesses now need to do. And this is what ESG tries to uh, frame and bring light to. Um, as I said, regions all over the world, particularly European and Asia, are putting in things and putting in requirements for corporations to adhere to circular economics and ESG. In the banking space and the private and the funding space, which hits the balance sheet of any company, uh, large companies need this. I just finished with a startup down in Canberra. They were after private equity. They needed to do an ESG framework. They needed to, to be able to get funding. Uh, it's key now. Um, so it's very important for larger companies, not the smaller companies that need that funding, going for a bank loan, you don't need to do it, but it'll come. And regulators globally have been ramping up efforts to tackle, tackle greenwashing, which is companies just going out and filling in the form saying, yeah, I've done that and haven't done any more. So as part of the BA, we can actually help influence those businesses to are they actually doing something about it. So ESG is becoming part of this new framework. I know it's boring and it's dry, but I just want to let people know that these frameworks are coming to play and they're being legislated on. I just want to put something local in uh, from The Economist. Uh, and this was last week, Australia's climate policy is all talk and no trousers. They're relying on future technology to help mitigate climate change and uh, ain't really doing much about it at the moment. That said, um, I know this personally, both New South Wales and Victoria governments mandating that suppliers adopt circular economics into their operations, which I, I referred to earlier on. I'm on the preferred supplier for the New South Wales procurement um, space and I have to adapt to that circular economics. There is actually a specific piece of requirements for suppliers that are on the preferred supply list to adhere to these things. This week, I actually attended a circular economic conference at Sydney University in person and virtually, which is really good. So there's lots of current things going on. Um, and a big one last week, President Biden enforced all their federal suppliers to adhere to, uh, to disclose uh, their emissions and set climate reduction targets as part of their process, you know, and going forward, which is where ESG comes in, talking about that governance piece, making sure it happens. And just today, Switzerland has adopted a law uh, requiring mandatory climate reporting for all public companies and banks. When you say Switzerland adopted a law, 
So what does it mean from a banking perspective at the end of the day? Do we need to worry about certain compliance? Or? We may do if we do business with Switzerland, yes. But I've put it up there as just a header. Europe is way ahead of the curve when it comes to this. Um, Australia is way behind. Um, but it's an example. Europe is putting this stuff into legislation. It's happening to make sure companies do the right thing. Um, going back to that greenwashing comment I made earlier on, you know, ESG is about doing a survey, doing workshops, ticking boxes. You can do that and put it in the in and do nothing. What they're trying to say is you now need to disclose your targets. You now need to prove that you've moved from A to B over a year. If you haven't, you're whacked over the head and get a fine, which is good because you need to get companies doing things, right? And, and governments are doing it by enforcing supply mandatory requirements. You know, New South Wales have done it, Victoria have done it. Let's see if the rest of the country does it. And I'm sure under Labour government that is going to happen because they're going to be pouring money rivers of money into climate change mitigation. The coalition government weren't interested, but under Albanese, I absolutely know yeah. it's going to happen. Yeah. So let's, in this ESG space, we're all BAs, we're all stakeholder managers. I want to talk about some of the fundamentals that you need to think about. We've all done BABOC, hopefully. We've all engaged stakeholders all along the journey in whatever we do as BAs. But there's some particular things I think in the ESG space you might, might want to just keep your mind around and, and, and think about. One of the key things that value that we as BAs add to a business, and I, a lot of BAs miss this, I think, because it's very, very strong in, in what we do, is you add value to that business because you ask the questions they probably haven't thought about. And we're trained to ask these questions. I, I've done many, many assignments in many, many different businesses. And you know to get them to think, prompt them to start thinking outside of the box or outside just what they're doing today, thinking about their impacts of what they do. I cross-pollinate stakeholders so they understand the value chain effect. It's very effective, gets people thinking outside of what they do, gets out of silo thinking. Because um, everything you do impacts somebody else and what somebody else impacts you. It's always good to know where you are in the chain. Key thing, always be sensitive to the emotions of the people you're dealing with. Um, me as BA, uh, I'm a change agent. You know, I'm the harbinger of change, you know, and it could be good, it could be bad. I've worked in places where half the accounting workforce has been disappeared because I put in a BI tool. You know, they're going. Uh, but I've got to engage them to get what I need out of them. So you need to be sensitive to your stakeholders. And I, I just want to draw that out just to be mindful, empathetic, whatever the current words are, you know. We can see the big picture with an eye for detail. I go back to what I was saying earlier on about the finance bit, the organisation. We are business analysts, underline the B, the business. In this space, also priorities do change pretty quickly. Be mindful of that. So your senior stakeholders may well have to change their adopt how they go about things. You need to be mindful of that. You can't lock things in. One of the other things you'll come across in this space is you may well be dealing with third-party people and vendors, particularly suppliers or customers. And to minimise that greenwashing stuff, you need to be aware um, of uh, what they are actually doing. Are they as green as they claim and see evidence of it or see their business processes? You need to get to that space because what they do affects the brand of the company you're working for, the organisation you're working for. It's just something to be mindful of uh, as, as you go about what you do. And just remember, we influence through our study analysis. We become trusted advisors on that journey. So ESG is a changing framework adapting to trends and legislation. So stakeholders won't always know what's going on. It's a good thing for you to know if you want to get into this space because you can get back to that trust advisor, influencer. Requirements of risk, sorry, risk uh, in this space is, is very important and understanding what the risks are around what you're analysing uh, and some of the questions. Key thing you should all know this, but we blend emotional intelligence with objective details gathering. We're not caught up on the output. On the, on the solution, we're objective about what's going on. So, uh, so we're not tied to the answer. Management is, they're the owners of the process, they're the owners of what's going on. The executive, the enablers, we're the facilitators, the information exchange and the advisors, but we don't say, this is what you need to do. BA should never be in that space. You'll find yourself in a lot of trouble if you get there. Last but not least, every organization has a myriad of stakeholders that influence the way it operates. Everyone's got a bit to say, everyone's got a bit to play. So when it comes to ESG efforts, it's important to optimize stakeholder engagement all along the way as much as you possibly can to manage that change that's always going on and manage the emotions. 
in this space, particularly in Australia, because it's fairly new, uh, a lot of the leading sort of arguments were, well, we don't know where we're going, we don't know how to do it. We're moving away from a traditional business model and we're going into another space. Like, I have never done 70% renewables in my inputs. I'm used to using trees all the time. I don't know about plastic wood or whatever. What's that going to do to my brand? What's that going to do to my product? It's a new space for them, and that's why you need to think about your emotions and what's going on there. All right? So there are key things, I think, uh, as a BA, uh, you need to consider. All right. I'm going to move to the next one. Uh, any questions on this? Oh, good. Thank you. So what is ESG and what can business do? As I said, um, are you on? It is a communications tool and it is a report. Um, one of the things it does indicate is the ESG risks, which can cause material and financial reputation to a harm. Uh, sorry, ha reputational harm to a business. Let's get back into the group of things after all that IT snafu. All right. So one of the things to note there is failing to report and manage ESG related issues is seen itself as risky business nowadays. One of the things I'll just draw back to earlier on is uh, ESG and circular economy does improve the financial performance of a company. There's some of the tidbits here. Many customers prefer to shop with ethical businesses and actually don't mind paying a premium to do so, um, which is great for revenue and could, be, uh, could increase your costs. If a business is adopting ESG approaches or circular economics, it shows a proactive approach to sustainability issues and achieves greater trans transparency about the results. And that's much, much, uh, sorry, very, very important for uh, improving the customer and corporate brand of a company, going back to those intangibles on the balance sheet that I was talking about earlier on. So also from a commercial side of things, uh, strong ESG policies and compliance to ESG does help when tendering for projects. It's now becoming a, a requirement. As I mentioned, the preferred supplier list for New South Wales government says you've got to start following these, some of these circular economics principles. ESG will be coming. Um, and as I said, there is a direct link between ESG roadmap tasks, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, to financial outcomes. So, Susan, are there any questions? Is everybody on board? I just want to make sure we haven't lost an awful lot of people, but it's good that people are still here and people have shown some patience. It does look like we're going to run over 10 minutes. All right. Wonderful. Okay. So going forward, good. Going forward, it's about managing risk, being responsible to others, building your business in a different way, not just for profit, and creating a new operating framework and reporting mechanism. So let's go to the BA stakeholder thinking of view of ESG. Environment, key stakeholder groups in the environment, in the environment space are your suppliers. You know, you might want to have a look at the suppliers and what they're doing about ESG. Do they use renewables, uh, recyclables? What sort of uh, inputs are you getting from your suppliers? Supply chain, now I separated it out separately because it's not just about suppliers, it's about the logistics behind your supply chain. Um, an example would be in a recent uh, job that I did, um, having had to adopt the ESG principles, going back to the AI role that I was doing, um, they cut their 16 boxes, sorry, increased their 16 boxes per pallet to 32. Halves the transportation costs, halves the uh, number of times um, trucks have to come up and, and, and deliver. So big financial impact and uh, reduction in, in box sizes. Energy suppliers, reviewing energy suppliers, Big stakeholders. ESG indirectly helps businesses improve their finances. So ESG is about compliance and it's about reporting. Yeah. Um, and it's about going away and having a look at my current state and I want to get to a new state and reporting and you make these changes. And I will talk about that journey in my upcoming slides. So yes, it's not a um, financial report. It is a report to report to external stakeholders like banks, equity, financing, and to other companies and your competitors and your suppliers to see that you're a responsible corporate citizen. That's what it's about. But to do it properly and not greenwash, you're going to make changes in your organization and they are going to affect your operations, what you do. And in that space, supply chain is extremely important and suppliers are extremely important. Like, do you really want to be using someone that's using fresh trees all the time to build furniture? Why can't you use re re reusable? Like building construction. It, that 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 can be answered in many different ways. Yes, it's going to be a cost of compliance. 
yes, you're going to have to change the way you do things. That's a cost, it's an administrative cost, yes. But you dig deeper, you'll find you'll change the operations and how you do things to get to a point where you might be using recyclable material or material that is renewable, which costs less. Nike, I, I said this before in a previous presentation, have now invented a shoe which is entirely recyclable when it goes out and it's used for using recyclable materials. They use um, rubbish pits, you know, tips, those things in Manila, you know, a great big road, you know, a mile long um, to make a Nike shoe. So, how does a company do a business case? Do they do a business case? Absolutely. There are specialists that um, build business cases. I know a few that it's quite. Or, or positive to comply? I'm not really sure. What? Like the business case to justify whether. Going into ESG? Well, yes. Yeah. And the business case to enable some process operations or, or changes in their internal operations, like we need new software. Um, there is software for ESG reporting, but then there's all the internal operational changes they may want to make. It could cost you a little, a little bit more to cut out a load of suppliers because they don't meet your ESG criteria. Um, because you want to report as a responsible corporate citizen, yet you've got people down the road that use diesel trucks at 40 years old. Do you want oh, that? My question was, um, does the company need to build a business case to comply to ESG? And is the business case going to be cost effective, positive, profitable, or is actually resulting in a cost here? base? Here? No, well, a few hours and questions. So, yeah, well, you're. you're People bring in. Yeah, yes, you would. Some companies would adopt a business case and enable an ESG framework. Yes, because you're going into the unknown. So they're going to want to measure the impacts of going into an ESG space. There are the compliance costs involved, but there's going to be lots of opportunities, uh, which you can review as an opportunity lost, which is a cost. Yes, and opportunities also on the flip side, there are benefits. If carbon tax is in place, yeah. yes, that's right. So that's one of the mechanisms they've been trying to use to bash companies over the head to minimise their climate impacts is carbon tax, but not terribly effective. There is a feedback to say the business Sit here, made, Susan. The business may also want to ask whether they can stay in business without investing in ESG. Okay, that's a really, really good question. Um, and... I'll answer it by saying this. If you don't stay ahead of your competition or with the competition who are moving down in the ESG space, you're going to lose out. Let's go back to the consumers. I prefer to buy something that's recyclable. Now I know it's there. Um, I do look for the brand that's been responsible. There's lots of uh, mechanisms where, let's say, foodstuffs, responsible fishing, for example, or recyclable packaging. Um, I want to buy those, and I don't care if it costs me five cents extra. At least I know it's through a reputable company that's doing the right thing. So if you don't get it, sorry, Susan, stay here because I can't see the questions, and you can at least, is that, is that all right? Yeah, you can yeah, drink your okay. wine, that's fine. You know, <laughs> fine but I don't know if anyone can see. No, so kidding. it's very it's it's a, it's a very costly not to go down this road. Um, certainly it's mandated by governments, but if you don't go down it, if you don't follow what your competitors do, you will lose out and you become to be viewed as a bit of a dinosaur. And you'll lose your your branding will go down and your customer base will go down. Yes, Brianna's asking a question. Just this is the most entertaining evening. So we are. my question, uh, my question, James, is I got so mention. you did mention couple um couple of times uh, reputable supplier etc. Yes. How far and how deep do you go in the supply chain and the logistics? Because do you know if one um, one supplier removed or five suppliers removed, people are still complying and doing the right thing? And second part of the question is, you mentioned, for example, Nike and the recyclable aspect. But these people, uh, very a lot of these companies are also um, entangled with model slavery. Correct. How do you know, for example, that this recyclable product is not a product of uh, modern uh, yeah. slavery and that you are just yeah. kind of shifting evil from one pot into the other. 
Okay, very good question. Thanks very much, Brianna. So the first part, um, peeling the onion, how many circles of suppliers to suppliers to suppliers before they get to you? That's a really good question. And I guess it's up to the company itself about how far they actually want to go um, to not impact their own branding. It is a question that the executive might want to be asking themselves and the board want to be asking themselves how far they want to go in reviewing the supplier. So you'd definitely be talking with the procurement team, the logistics team, about how far they go. And you could say, you know, we'll cut it off at three suppliers up the chain. Um, you know, that should be good enough. But, you know, if there's some real rotten apple that's five suppliers down the chain, then you don't want to be, maybe you want to, by exception, pull them out. To the second point that you made about slavery or, or misuse of, of resource, labour resource, that is covered in social. So it's not moving from one pot to another. It is actually, that's the S component of ESG. Um, so I'll talk about that now. It's the social bit, as I mentioned earlier, and it's about the communities. The company is not a community all on its own. It's not an island on its own. It is subject to engaging with communities both ways. The primary community you have is your employees, the people who work for you. And in this space, it's all about employee well-being, mm -hmm. um, uh, diversity, and gender balance and equalization. A lot of people, older school, that wasn't important. But nowadays, culturally, uh, certainly in the Western world, that's become extremely important. Um, you know, I want to see diversity. And I, from my experience, working from the late 80s, I know things have changed, particularly in the last 20 years. Um, the cultural background and the mix in the offices are completely different from 25 years ago. And I think it's fantastic because you get this whole range of views that you never had before. And you get that cultural inflection in a lot of decisions that are being made and sensitivities are right there. That is captured in the S part of the ESG framework. So, yes, Brianna, um, that is part of the, this checking. All right. I've mentioned that the community is virtual community, diversity community, customers and clients. That's part of your society as well. So ESG is a measure and framework. So um, ESG sort of encourages diversity, compensation, and the supply chain and the human resources. So there is another comment. Another question? Not a question, it's just a comment saying companies need a social license to operate. Good. Oh. Indeed, indeed. And it is being seen that, um, you know, companies need a social license to operate. It is. It's no longer the single shareholder and just profit. You go out there and you make money and you know, screw everyone into the ground and make a buck and give it to the shareholder. It's no longer shareholders only. And to that boot, if you are a shareholder and an investor in a company that does that, you won't be having a great investment because those companies will be going down going forward. Because particularly with the millennials and the younger generation, they want to be values aligned with a lot of companies. And that means diversity. That means gender balancing. That means being open-minded about a lot of things, not closed-minded at the Victorian stage, not, it's not in the 60s, 70s, or 80s anymore. It's 2020 now. I mean, I still make big like, gaps from when I started work. It's still it's a really big jump for me sometimes in the office space. So let's talk about governance a little bit. Now, this is the key part. Governance underpins decisions, the strategic direction of a company, and how decisions are made and how they're enabled and measured in metrics. And we all know as BAs, if you worked on projects, and steering committees, project manager, enterprise architects, there's a governance process for getting your requirements signed off. Have we actually made sure that those requirements meet the IT solution that's been delivered, the UAT, all that sort of, there's governance around all that sort of stuff. That's the stuff we're used to. It happens up the big level too, way up above you. And the governance is also about that external reporting piece. And it's up to the board. We've set the strategic direction. We want to get 70% targets, for instance, of recycled materials and their inputs. Did we do it? The ESG framework and the measurement of that helps them do that and helps them make decisions about going forward. So it's an ongoing thing. And it's the governance around how we manage with our customers and suppliers. You know, do we want to sell to a customer that then goes and sells it to, you know, some horrible regime in middle of nowhere or something that just does the wrong thing with a product? No. And you don't want to be buying supplies or something that's got a rotten, as in slavery, for resources which we don't, do know that's happened. The apparel market uh, is the worst offender when it comes to uh, emissions, apparently, um, and, and climate change impacts. It's not cows. It's not oil. It's the, it's, um, the apparel industry. They make up 30% of the damage that's done because we buy a garment and throw it away three months later. You, you think about it. And that's why it's that's the big area 
um, for the circular economy. But I won't talk about that today. All right. So moving along, because I know we're running out of time. I've still got a bit to get through. Um, Susan, you call that question. So let's talk about the BA journey on the ESG transition. Where do we sit? Step one. Step two. Step one. Let's confirm the strategic objectives of the board and the executive. And question their alignment to sustainability. You're an analyst. And our role is in inquiring as to what this company doing. What's the organization doing? And in the ESG space, you start at the strategy, you start at the objectives, because that sets the plan for where everything else is going on. And you want to know what you're doing aligns to that strategy and objectives. Key part, you identify the key stakeholders. We just talked about stakeholders on the previous slide, understanding them, start to document them. Start to think, identify and decide the data that you're going to require. Now, ESG comes with a framework and checklists, and it helps you decide some of that, and the metrics you're going to use. So step two, where's going? What's going on? So step two, we're going to engage stakeholders and we're going to conduct something called the materiality assessment. It's the term that they use in the ESG framework space. I personally don't like it because it suggests finance and accounting because it's actually an accounting term. Um, but that's the word they use and it's a survey, it's a checklist, and I'll take you through some of those questions you'll be asking in the next slide. And you ask questions to the stakeholder. We complete those checklists and surveys that we conduct. So let's have a look at some of the questions you're going to be asking these groups. So remember what I was saying earlier on, just the overriding prism of focus is the questions that we ask, do they fit into that strategic objective of what the company is doing? Keep that in mind, keep that big picture while you're looking at the detail as well. That's what BA should be able to do. So in the, I, I have, in my own research, um, developed uh, checklists and done a lot of research on checklists, and there's about 170 key questions. But as a be and this is what coming is coming off the research, but I've looked at them and gone, I'm a business analyst. Actually, I ask a lot more questions than that. Um, like they'll say, Do you have a policy in place? The next question I say, What process have you got to support that policy to enable it to happen? So let's just talk about the environmental space. Does the company have and adhere to environmental policy, which sets out clear commitments and targets to improve the company's environmental footprint? It's a yes or no answer. As a BA, I then go. If so, great, what are they? What are the processes to support that? If it's a no, tick, there's work to do. So either way, I'm winning as an analyst. There's work as a consultant, there's work. Climate change, does the company regularly monitor its greenhouse gas emissions? Air pollution, is it fully compliant with any external compliance? These are things that they need to be asked. And if it's a no, as in current state, and they want to move forward, this is their roadmap. You start to develop a roadmap out of this as a BA and be able to influence the stakeholders. This is what's got to happen. So in society space, does the company have policies in place to ensure the health and safety uh, of consumers and, and employees? Does it uh, comply to um, external regulations in that uh, social space, claims, enforcement actions against employees, stakeholders? Because these are all risks to a company. Um, as I said earlier on, ESG is about managing risks to a company as you go forward. And community involvement, it could be, do you engage the local community? Are you standing up local fairs? Are you supporting the community? Are you actually using some people that are out of work for part-time work? Those sorts of things. You don't stand alone, you utilize your community and community actually builds brands and it builds your interaction with the local community. Uh, you think of the number of towns where a large company is shut down, like a meatworks in the country town shuts down, everyone's out of work. And this happens all the world over. You know, globalization, bat and bang, just impacts millions of people in America, here, worldwide. Think about your local community, and this is what companies should be doing, with drawing back into a local community, as well as the virtual community and the global community. And there'll be questions around human rights and labor practices, going back to your slavery mark uh, question. And then there's the governance. Have we got the appropriate board structure? Um, what framework have we got for outcome measurements? And what things are we going to do to move from A to B, uh, current state to future? It looks at things like ethics and codes and conduct. If you're interested in this, happy if you call me, but there's a whole bunch of questions and all of them are yes and no's. And then there's a subset of questions about, okay, if no, what's the process? What isn't the process? And that feeds into your roadmap. So moving on, step three, produce a report of the current state, assessment of the metrics and the opportunities for digitization, and loads of other opportunities, and develop that roadmap for change. And all of us as BAs, we can do this. And step four, Implement the roadmap actions. Utilize your BA techniques to get to that space. 2B processes, system and org changes will happen, particularly in the system space. There's a lot of stuff 
in the IT space, digitization opportunities that BAs will get involved in in this area. And if you've been there from step one, you'll understand what's going on within the business. You know the stakeholders, you know where they've come from and where they want to go, you know their pain points. You're fluently versed in not only operational and processes, you now understand the link into the IT platforms and the software, the apps that can be used to help them do that. And of course, the good old UAT, if you get involved in that, you know. And the next step, step five, when you finish it all, you're measuring outcomes and you're implementing some sort of continuous uh, improvement program. And perhaps, uh, thank you. Uh, revising roadmap and revisiting processes. All right. Uh, do we want to do this? We're right at the end. <laughs> so I'll continue. All right. So here, there's a VA journey all the way from the beginning to the end. And we've got a multiple set of arrows in our quiver that we can use to target this. So I hope you like my little pretty pictures in the bottom. You know, a little checklist there, teaching and talking to people <laughs> about the roadmap. And Nirvana, the hand with the leaf. So I, I'm going to wrap it up very shortly. Yes. Yes. Companies are at the moment in Australia that um, are very actively doing the whole ESG assessment. Um, I don't know the answer to that one, but what I will tell you, it's all yeah. banks are on board, uh, finance institutions are on board. Um, if I was to talk about, as I said, the startup company I was with that wants private equity is out there for funding. They have been on board for a couple of years. Um, a lot of companies are moving towards it. It's now in the paper every day. Um, you know, whether it's the financial review or the Sydney Morning Herald, ESG, circular economics, it's in the paper every day. And you're going to become a dinosaur if you're not picking up on it and going, oh, why does this affect me? And that's why I want to take Smart VA. Let's go and help these people. And the question mark for a lot of companies is, I want to get there, but I don't know how to. And that's where we come in and go, we can help you. This is one of the ways of doing it. There is a question. Yep. How does one become a specialist ESG BA? Is there a good pathway to follow? That's the road I have just been traveling on. <laughs> and no, there is not a special one. There's lots of people diving into it at the moment. Um, I've learned the hard way, if you like. I've, I've built up groups and communities that I interact with. Um, I have done a lot of research what's going on overseas um, because it's happening overseas, not happening in Australia. You'll get management consultants like the Big Four EY and KPMG getting into it, but, you know, they don't have a great... Uh, let's say the reputation of them is not really sought after. Mm -hmm. They're very big, too big for small businesses. You know, seven thousand, ten thousand dollars a day. They can't afford that. You know, and that's how these people charge. Um, mm -hmm. There's there's key things that a BA can do. It is a checklist. It's running workshops, answering those questions by those stakeholder groups. I'm more than happy to share my information. I'm online on LinkedIn every day, virtually. I'm going to be building modules around this about what we do. Um, over the next six months, mm -hmm. because this is the space I'm getting into. I've already got one ESG client already. Um, and I'm working with another group of people, and actually they're biochemical engineers or come from you know, engineering backgrounds are getting into the space because they understand the technical changes that need to happen because yeah. um, they're more into utilities measurement and things like that. But I thought, well, I'm a business analyst. I go and talk to stakeholders all the time. I go in and ask questions. I fill out requirements. ESG is almost the same thing. Uh, and funny enough, when I was really hit the road studying this a few months ago, three or four months ago, and I looked at the checklist, back in the 90s, I did something called the balanced, balanced scorecard framework. It's almost exactly the same, mm -hmm. except they put the environment in it. That wasn't around in the 90s. Now, I helped put the scorecard, the balanced scorecard framework in with a joint venture between IBM and Telstra. It's a half billion dollar company. They toyed around with it. I wrote up the paper for it. And I'm reading this, I'm thinking, I can do this. No, it's, this is not difficult. But the lovely thing about being a business owner, this is one, I've done the checklist, I've engaged the stakeholders, and that has given me a whole flood of options, recommendations, and things to do as a business analyst and provide some options and recommendations back. Yes, I've got a question from Brianna. Um, yeah, if you want to, yeah, yeah, probably better because my phone's here. There is a, actually. There's more questions. So let, let Brianna just go and then yeah. we'll take the question so, from. So much a question, just like um, a thought that um, came to me. Thinking about the way, the way you just described the approach to ESG, would you, would you say, say that, that it is almost, almost 
a, a new lens on the non functional requirements, like, like a new set of non functional um, requirements and considerations that we should add to add, 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 add to at the category. Our, 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 uh, uh, yes. yes. It, but there's also readings. Yes. Yes. Um, there is a question here. Yeah. Yep. Do you produce a company report for investors or regulators? Uh, that's, uh, that's what, what uh, the ESG, ESG report, report is, all is all about. about. Yes. So it becomes part of the financial disclosure and part of the framework. So I would produce a report with metrics. Um, there is standard software that's produced overseas, and I'm, I'm actually doing some research on some of those rather than building myself. So sorry, there was a question, another question. Do I, in that, I don't do any public reporting. It would be part of their external communications. A lot of large companies have communications divisions. It would become part of that. Excellent. Let me just wrap it up on a final sheet. So look, we've gone through that little journey there, the five key steps. All of them involve normal BA practices that we do every day, I think. We reviewed it from a strategic level the different types of stakeholder groups and the focus that we need in the ESG space. We conducted surveys, we conducted workshops, we developed and documented a roadmap with recommendations and options. We've conducted a very deep stakeholder analysis. You've seen all the stakeholder groups across the ESG pillars. Along the way, we're providing counsel, options and recommendations. It all produces work for BAs and very easy for us to jump into if you're interested in this space. And again, being BAs, we're looking at processes, we're looking for ways to improve the way the business operates, we're looking for opportunities to digitize, and digitization is a real key enabler for a lot of this. Um, and of course, process changes to support those platforms. Um, we're all about, let's get the current state, now where we're going, let's document the future state. That's what a lot of us do. So that's it from me, other than asking some questions if they come through, but before people go, Susan, how do I share this in the chat? I want to share if people can. Um, yeah, I want to. You can, you can actually. I've just shared a Mentimeter with everybody. If people could use that, it would be really good yes. just to get the reaction. If you can go to that link, it would be lovely. Um, just to, just take a couple of minutes. But I want to say, look, thank you very much for everyone's patience this evening with the snafus, the technical hiccups, the hurdles, the jumping, the running, the patience. We did it all. And we made it. <laughs> and we made it, which is really good. But I want to say a big thank you for your patience and, and for coming along tonight. Um, you've used Mentimeter before, haven't you? Oh, you're, there you go. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. Well, look. Um, brilliant. The code worth presentation works as well. So that's really good. Um, I'm really happy with that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, is, it is good. Yeah, it is. So everybody, thank you very much for tonight. But um, look, if people are interested in ESG, please hook up on LinkedIn with me. Um, my phone number is on the bottom of my emails, and it's, I think it is on LinkedIn. But send me an email. That's on LinkedIn. Um, this is a space Smart BA is getting into. Um, I don't think it's a challenge for us as BAs to get into this space if you're really interested in it. I'm at the tail end of my career and I'm just finding this stuff really more interesting than all the stuff I ever did before. Mm. And it means something, you know, to me. It's adds, meaningful. It's meaningful and it adds purpose to my career, but it also gives something back. I've learned an awful lot over my career. I've learned from an awful lot of people and it's time to give something back. And now it's a sense of urgency, if you like, but a sense of deliberation and how best do I use my intellect and my skill set to help others, you know. Okay. Having been an accountant, sorry, and being a BA, I know business very well. I know how to talk to stakeholders. I can talk to a CFO in their accounting language, which is not usually very easy to do. All they think about is budgets and PL. Account they're not interested in. But, you know, please. Thank you. Thank you.